Welcome to our service here at Bethel this morning. Thank you for your warm welcome to myself and our family. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We've been looking forward to this day for a long time. And uh, it's good to be with you here today. Uh, let me give you some notices uh, for uh, the, the week ahead. Uh, if you stay behind after the service this morning, uh, there'll be refreshments served downstairs. So please do stay behind and uh, it'll be good to have fellowship together. And then uh, tonight, uh, I'll be preaching again at six o'clock. So please, if you can come tonight, do come tonight and it'll be good uh, to, to meet together. We'll be looking at uh, the first book of the Bible tonight, Genesis. So please uh, do come uh, to that. Uh, Tuesday uh, at 7 p.m. Is, is Impact Group for, uh, for secondary school aged children. Uh, Wednesday here, uh, there's the Little Lambs for uh, five and unders. And then at 7 p.m., uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the Bible together and praying together. I'll be leading that time together, so please uh, do come next Wednesday. And then on Thursday, there's Explorers at half past four for uh, primary school aged children. And then Saturday, uh, just up the road in Kaplanant, uh, is uh, the ordination and induction service uh, for the new pastor here, uh, who is me. Um, so, so do come. Uh, we appreciate your prayers, and uh, there'll be a uh, buffet here afterwards as well. Uh, it's a nice little sweetener for you if you do come. Uh, if you can help with, with the food at all, uh, do speak to Anona or Anna. Okay, and next Sunday uh, I'll be preaching morning and evening and there'll be communion during the evening service. Those are all the notices. If I've forgotten anything, please uh, grab me afterwards and I'll, I'll make things right this evening. Uh, let's read from Psalm 100. Uh, let's set our hearts upon uh, why we're here this morning. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We're going to stand, we're going to sing our first song, we're going to sing of the faithfulness of our God as we sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand and sing if we're able.
Well, I wanted to speak to the children now. Hands up if you are a child. Okay. And there's some big kids here as well, I think. Um, I wanted to get on the front foot when I was planning for children's talks this week. So I've planned out the next 26 I'm going to do. And the way I've done that is I've done an, I'm going to do an alphabet. Do you want to come down to the front? Okay. If you want to come down to the front so you can... <laughs> sit there. Sit there for now, okay? Great. Okay. So, for the next 26 times I'm going to do children's talks, I'm going to tell you about people from history that have lived their lives for Jesus, okay? And we're going to start with the first one this week. So what letter do you think their surname is going to begin with? Oh. It's on the board. Whoa. <laughs> it's going to start with A, isn't it? Fantastic. So the first person I want to tell you about is a lady called Gladys Aylward. Can anyone work out who's good at maths here? I know there's some people good at maths here. How old was Gladys Aylward when she died? She wasn't four. Not 54. She wasn't six. She was 68. She was in her 68th year, wasn't she? Okay, so let me tell you a bit about Gladys Aylward and why she's posing there with three children. Well, she was born in London. Okay. She was born in London 122 years ago. Just like I was born in London, but I wasn't born 122 years ago, thankfully. And she left school early. And by the age of 14, she had her first job. And her first job was to look after the house of a very wealthy family. And she worked as a maid. And one of her favourite things to do when she was a maid was to sneak up to uh, the master's library. This house was so grand and so big, it had its own library. And she loved taking the books off the shelf and reading about different parts of the world. And one place that fascinated her was a place called China. And uh, Gladys went to church. Uh, she went to church every Sunday. And it was when she was 18. There's no one here who's 18, is there? But when she was 18, her life changed forever. Because she heard a sermon. She heard a message in church about Jesus. And in that day, she put her trust in him. And it was that time she realized she wanted to go across the sea and tell other people about Jesus and she went to the organization when she was a bit older she went to the organization that that sends people to China and uh, the director there was a very serious man and he was sighing and he was shaking his head and he said you shouldn't have left school so early that was a silly thing to do and you're 26 now so we've skipped a bit of time in the story you're 26 you're far too old to be able to learn a new language. Now, who here can speak more than one language? I can. No, can you? <laughs> is, anyone, is, it, is it quite hard to, to, to learn a new language, would you say? Yeah, I'm sure it is. And the older you get, the harder it is for your brain to learn new things. So the man was very concerned that Gladys wouldn't be able to learn the new languages. So her dream was crushed, uh, sh but she wouldn't take no for an answer, okay? And little by little, she saved up lots of money, penny by penny. And she saved enough money to travel all the way to China. Now, how do you think she got there? On a boat. Very good. She did go on a boat, and she went on something else as well. Play it was before... People went on planes, but that's how you would go. If you went to China now, that's how you would go. Fantastic. Train. Yes. She went on a train. She went on a boat. And she even walked some of the way. That was an amazing thing, isn't it? And when she told people that's how she was going to get to China, people laughed at her. They said it was impossible. 
two years later, after lots of planning and lots of talking to people that knew what they were talking about, she kissed her family goodbye and she started the journey to China. And this was her prayer. She said, here's my Bible, here's my money, and here's me. Use me, God. Use me. So she had a, a tiny amount of money left. She had her Bible, she had her pen, she had her tickets, she had her passport, and she carried a suitcase in each hand uh, with a saucepan tied to one of them and a kettle tied to the other with a piece of string. And after many weeks of grueling travel, she finally, finally arrived in China in a mountain village called Yangcheng. And as she entered the village on this mountainside, a group of children saw her and they screamed. They were so scared. And two women got some mud and threw it at Gladys. She was very confused. Another missionary who was already here came up to Gladys and says, don't worry, this happens all the time. They call us Lao Yang Kwai, which means foreign devils. And it's something you'll have to get used to. And so it was very hard for Gladys to settle in. Now, this village that she came to was an overnight stop for lots of people to be able to travel through. And uh, people who sold things like spices and rice and food, uh, they would often pass through Yang Cheng. And so Gladys and her friend Jeannie decided to open a little hotel. And it was a place to sleep, and it was a place where they cooked some lovely food, and it was a place where they could tell people stories. Now, people in China are a bit like people here, I think, in Wales. They love telling stories. And so, you like stories, don't you? And so, when people would stop for the night in this hotel, they would tell them stories. And do you know who they told stories about? Yes, have you? They told people about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? But one thing that was very sad about this little village was that there was lots of people in this village, or they were little children that didn't have mums and dads. Do you know what the, the word is for someone who doesn't have a, a mum or dad, a child? Yes, Boaz. An orphan. You've got mummy and daddy. Well done. They were orphans. They were orphans. It's, it's very sad, isn't it? And what they did, what Gladys and Jeannie began to do was they adopted these orphans and took them into the hotel and fed them and gave them a home and told them stories about Jesus. And at one time, guess how many orphans there were? There were a hundred orphans living in this hotel. And that's three of the orphans there. They were very well looked after by Gladys. A few years later, so we're up to 1948 now when she was 46, the Chinese government told Gladys that she had to go home. It's very sad. Uh, she'd done lots of good work and lots of people had trusted in Jesus because of Gladys, but she had to go back to Britain. And then uh, when she was in Britain, she said, you know what, I want to do that again. So this time she went to a place called Taiwan. Uh, she was someone who wouldn't take no for an answer. She showed bravery in traveling alone all the way to China, all the way from London, and she knew that she wanted to tell everyone that she met about Jesus, and she wanted to share the good news with them. And I want to tell you about a special Bible verse that sums up what Gladys did. This is from Psalm 68 and verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. These children have been left alone by their mums and dads, but Gladys cared for them because God cared for these children, because God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Isn't it a good and wonderful God that we serve here this morning? And God showed us how wonderful he is by coming into this world as a man. And Jesus, uh, his name was, and he was strong, and he was kind. And we're going to sing a song now about how wonderful Jesus is. And uh, uh, I'd love to talk to you a bit more about Gladys afterwards if you want to ask me any more questions about her. But well done for listening so well. If you want to go back to your seats, if you've moved seats. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, Let's uh, bow our heads and let's pray to this Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world to save sinners. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is strong and kind. Uh, We see strength in this world, uh, but strength that is is cruel and merciless. Uh, We see uh, some kindness in this world, but it is often uh, with sinful motives, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are strong and kind in every way, that you are perfect and you are holy. We thank you that we can come and worship you this morning. We thank you for the the people that are gathered here this morning uh, as we uh, come together to, to remember that the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead. He was triumphant over sin and, and, and sin's power and death and guilt and all these things that can uh, shackle us and, and confine us, Lord. We thank you that these things have been defeated at the cross and at the, at the graveside, Lord, as the Lord Jesus uh, triumphed over death. Uh, we thank you uh, that we can uh, pray together and sing together and, and look at your word together. Oh, Lord, these are wonderful reminders of what you have done. And Lord, we thank you that you are are working in us and through us, that the Holy Spirit is at work in the life of each and every Christian here this morning, uh, that we are being daily renewed to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We we come before you now in in confession. Uh, We are sorry uh, for all the times this week where we have, have run away from you, where we have rebelled and our hearts have been cold. Uh, Lord, uh, we know um, better than, than others how uh, far we have strayed this, this uh, week. And you know uh, better than, than we do ourselves. And yet, uh, Lord, you are uh, willing to forgive. You are loving and you are kind. And uh, in you is, is forgiveness that is full and free. Uh, we thank you uh, that you... Uh, remember us in our weakness and you tell us to come closer. You beckon us to come near and you forgive us. And we thank you so much for that. There is um, such a weight for the guilty sinner. There is such a a load to bear, Lord. And yet, if we come to the Lord Jesus, uh, we can find freedom. So we pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't yet know that that forgiveness, who doesn't yet know that freedom, uh, that you would help them to come to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that you have brought the church to this point today where uh, we uh, have a a, a pastor in in full-time employment. Lord, that is an answer to prayer uh, for for many years. Lord, we thank you um, we thank you as a as a family uh, that uh, we have been received here so so kindly and so willingly, Lord, and we just pray that everything that we uh, do together as a, as a church, Lord, would, would be honouring to you. Uh, we, uh, we thank you uh, for your help and your guiding hand, and we, we trust in you uh, for, the, for the years to come, that uh, we might see um, change in this community, that we would see more and more people come to know the Lord Jesus for themselves, uh, that uh, the church here would be built up and that uh, we would uh, long to, uh, to please the Lord Jesus in all that we do. Would you help us then? Uh, we can't do any of these things in our own strength and we need, we need your help. And so we pray for your help in the preaching of the word today. Would you, uh, would you speak powerfully uh, through your servants, Lord? Would you help us to listen and help us to put these things into action, Lord? May we never... Uh, uh, separate uh, what we hear and what we what we do so we pray that you would help us to be doers of your word oh lord would you help us now in jesus precious name we pray amen Amen. on sunday mornings uh, the plan is to to work through the book of titus so if you've got your bibles with you uh, or i think it's going to be on the the screen with me fantastic um, so we're reading uh, the first four verses of Titus. And let me encourage you to, to read ahead um, when 
you get the chance this week. It's good to, to be able to, uh, to know. Uh, it's only a small book with three chapters, so we read ahead and, and know where we're going. Um, and uh, it'll be a great encouragement to you, I'm sure, as you read it. Uh, but let's read uh, this letter, and this is what we'll be looking at uh, after the next song. Uh, this is what it says. God's word says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour to Titus my true son in our common faith Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. We're going to uh, be, be looking at uh, what those words mean soon. Uh, but we're going to sing uh, once again before that. A word that comes up um, it, in Titus more than it does anywhere else in the Bible is the word Saviour. Saviour. Uh, to show that we, we have been saved from our sins. And so we're going to sing uh, this Final song before we uh, come to God's words about how the Lord has Ready? saved us. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Thank you for saving. sing your praise. You shed your blood for me. What can I say? You took my sin and shame, a sinner called by name. my only
Hello, hello. Great, thank you. Um, you can imagine, can't you, at uh, the mission headquarters and uh, when they're divvying up the different responsibilities that everyone has and they tell someone that they have to go to Crete. You can imagine the person that volunteers would feel slightly guilty saying, somebody's got to go. Uh, someone's got to go to this, this kind of paradise, uh, kind of like I island. Um, but as we pick up this short letter that we find in our New Testament, and we delve a little deeper into some of the things that were going on in first century Crete, we will soon realise how challenging a job this was going to be. This would be a, a really difficult mission. It was no day at the beach. Uh, now this letter is written by the man who penned nearly a quarter of the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul. And if you're new to church or you want to refresh your memory, uh, then you can read his amazing story in the book of Acts. Uh, there in that story, uh, in that historical account of this man Paul, or sometimes known as Saul, uh, we see a man who went from uh, being the, the church's most violent oppressor uh, to being the busiest evangelist there was. Um, from throwing people into prison to being thrown into prison himself for the sake of the gospel. And despite his many gifts and his passion for telling others about Jesus, uh, Paul was not a one-man team, was he? Far from it. Everything that he did was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Paul himself, of course, only could be in one place at one time. And so he had to be strategic about where he was. And so he therefore sent people out into different parts of the world. People that he trusted to go into the mission field. And Titus was someone that Paul clearly trusted. He was Paul's troubleshooter. Someone that he called upon when there was a really difficult situation. Over the course of the New Testament, uh, we know that Titus was sent to a number of difficult places that needed special attention. Uh, we don't know much about Titus's background, but we find his name dotted around the New Testament. Uh, we know that he was a Gentile, which means that he wasn't a Jew. And he was possibly even from Crete. And we know that he was led to faith by Paul. Uh, we know that he was sent to Corinth for a certain amount of time. Uh, it's in the second letter to the Corinthians that uh, Titus's name comes up again and again. Uh, you'll see his name crop up a number of times. And the last mention of Titus in our Bibles is in 2 Timothy, uh, where uh, we are told that Titus has gone to Dalmatia, an area which we know today as Croatia. Uh, so uh, Paul trusted this man. He calls him my partner and fellow worker in 2 Corinthians 8. Um, and knowing the difficult situations in both Corinth and that we will see later on in this book in Crete, we can gather then that Titus was a trustworthy man. He was a believer who could deal with difficult problems, uh, with insight and with patience and with grace. Uh, we read in Corinthians, Crete, a uh, word an unreached people group. Uh, if you read Acts chapter 2 and, and the uh, the sermon Peter preaches on Pentecost, it tells us there that there were Jews from Crete there uh, that had made the journey to Jerusalem for the Passover. So uh, th they had heard uh, some of the good news. Uh, but the reason why, why is... Is that right? So I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> So the reason why the people of Crete uh, were particularly difficult to reach was because of how entrenched the island was in their pagan worship. So according to Greek mythology, Zeus, who is the, the main chief god in Greek mythology, he was supposedly born on the island of Crete. So one of Paul's aims in this letter, as we read it, is to show us that the true god is so very different to the false gods 
that the island was worshipping. Now, whereas Zeus was a a made-up god, uh, a a story made by men uh, about a man who became God, Jesus was the true God who became man. The other aspect that Paul wanted uh, to convey was God's perfection, his holiness and his goodness. You see, uh, Zeus uh, was a, a, a god with a, with a small g uh, being made in the image of those who dreamt him up. Uh, the tales about Zeus show him to be violent and lustful and a liar. And Paul wants to show the people of Crete what the true God is like, how he is perfect and good. And my hope is that as we look at this letter, we will see that the message that Paul had for Titus is as applicable to 21st century Kladach as it was to 1st century Crete. And the overarching theme I want to have and the title that I've given this series is Belief and Behaviour. And the two things are intrinsically linked. What you believe cannot and must not be separated from what you do. Time and time again, uh, Paul wants Titus to remember that what we believe in our hearts will ultimately be lived out in our actions. So I want that to be at the forefront of our minds as we study this letter. But this morning, we're just looking at these first four verses that we read. And if you've got your Bibles open, that would be really helpful. And I want us to see four things this morning, okay? Four things. Now, the first of these things is there in verse 1, that truth leads to godliness. Truth leads to godliness. Uh, This is what verse 1 says. Uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Truth leads to godliness. Truth leads to godliness. How can that be? Well, it depends, doesn't it, on what your life is built upon. Uh, Jesus said, didn't he, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's only through having our our lives built upon the rock, upon Jesus Christ, that we can be godly. By coming to him daily uh, for all our needs. That's how we will become more godly, isn't it? How we will become more and more like Jesus. So what is the opposite of that? What is the opposite of having our lives built upon Christ? Well, it's what was happening in Crete and what was happening around us today. You see, whereas Jesus is unchangeable, he is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is consistent in every way. His words cannot be changed. Uh, For the uh, Cretans, as it is in, in our society today, truth is seen as optional, isn't it? Everyone has their own truth. Everything is fluid. It is subjective. People pride themselves on their freedom to choose what they want. We get to choose what is right and wrong. And ultimately, the lie of subjectivity, of of saying that there's no truth, leads to immorality. And when there's no outside source of godliness and goodness and justice, then... We become our own judges, don't we? And we see this at play in our own society today. Uh, When people remove the goodness and the clarity and the truth of the Ten Commandments, say, a standard for morality set by God, then there's confusion. Because the whole of life is lived in this grey area where uh, people don't know what is right and wrong because they just want to do what they want to do. There isn't a definitive right and wrong because everything is decided on how we feel. People do what they want, how they want, when they want, thinking that it will achieve happiness and fulfilment. And yet, are people any happier today? I don't think so. I think, if anything, people are sadder and more confused and more broken. So why does it cause pain? That's because there's no such thing as subjective truth. There's no such thing as as your own truth. There's there's truth and there's lies. Uh, John Benton, an English preacher, he said this, It is not a matter of opinion 
that a tablespoon of poison will kill you. It is objective truth. And if you were to try and live as if this were not true, you would soon die. You see, the world is not all a matter of opinion. The truth exists. So, of course, there are things that you can have an opinion on. Uh, we can't apply the same logic that we do with truth with things like f- food and music and fashion and, and uh, whatever it might be. Your taste in those things might differ to mine. Uh, you might think uh, a certain shirt looks nice and I might disagree with you. Uh, you might like a, a song that plays on the radio and I might think it sounds rubbish. Uh, but we cannot extend that sort of approach with morality. And sadly, this is how the world works today as it was in Crete. They thought they could believe one thing and live a life that didn't reflect that at all. And they saw truth as this, as this very fluid thing. So this morning, our call is to remember that God is a God of truth. And when we hold fast to God and the fact that he cannot lie, as it says later on in verse 2, we can have great confidence, can't we? We have something concrete to hold on to. Our faith is not a matter of opinion, is it? It is true. It is not something that may be disproved tomorrow. It's not something that may change with the times and seasons. It was as true 2,000 years ago as it is today. So that's the first thing this morning. Truth leads to godliness. Uh, Secondly, look at verse 2. Our hope is long promised. That's our second point. Our hope is long promised. Uh, The second thing I want to consider this morning is is this. When we read verse 1 and 2 together, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Uh, The best things in life take a lot of planning and preparation, don't they? Um, Who remembers the opening ceremony at the, the 2012 Olympics? Does anyone remember that? Uh, It was an amazing display of of ingenuity, of of drama and storytelling, of music and of comedy. And it was educational as it showed you uh, the the history of the British Isles. But it didn't happen overnight. Uh, People didn't show up and improvise this great display. Uh, The film director, Danny Boyle, was asked two years before whether he would be willing to direct it. And it took months of planning And there was a 27 million pound budget and there was tens of thousands of people involved and there was hundreds of rehearsals. And when we watched it on our tellies, it was staggering. But this is nothing compared to the planning and the preparation that went into the hope that there is for Christians today. As Paul says here, the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. The salvation story of the gospel is not something which has been two years in the making, or 200 years, or 2,000 years. Our great and glorious God has always known that he would one day create a people, and he foresaw that they would rebel, and in his kindness and mercy, he knew that he would one day come into the world and offer eternal life to those who put their trust in him. Isn't that amazing? And as far back as Genesis 3, uh, there's this promise of someone who would destroy the works of the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman, he says to the serpent, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So even there, With Adam and Eve in the garden, there is this promise of hope. And throughout the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament, there are so many promises of Christ to come. Little clues that give us an insight into what he would be like. That he would come from Abraham and that he would bless the nations. That he would be a king from the town of David. Uh, That he would be the prince of peace, born of a virgin. All these things and more point to the fact that this was no plan B. 
This was the plan from before the ages began. And our confidence in all of this is, of course, linked to the steadfast nature and the robustness of God's character in truth. It's hard, isn't it, when you wait for a long time uh, and you wait for something as uh, the people of Israel waited for the Lord. But they knew and they could be confident that the Lord would promise, uh, would deliver on his promises because of his character. Uh, Now, we don't have that luxury at all times, do we, Uh, with the things that we wait for. I remember a few years back, uh, we had our driveway done in our house in Cardiff. And the people that did the job were some of the most unreliable people I have ever come across. And uh, they started the job and they found it seemingly impossible to finish it. And they made so many assurances and promises that they would come back and finish it. Uh, But they couldn't be trusted. And one morning, when, when we were particularly at the end of our tether, uh, the, the main, uh, the lead builder, tried to assure me by saying, mate, look, if it's not finished by the end of this day, I'll stand here and you can punch me in the face. And he, he was six foot three, about six foot three wide. Um, the driveway was not finished that day and I, I didn't take him up on that offer. I didn't think it was a very good idea. Um, and we had to wait another few weeks for the driveway to be done Uh, and it was painful that wait uh, for a resolution to a resolution to come because we couldn't trust the person in charge we didn't know if he would actually come true with his promise Um, but we have hope when God makes a promise because he cannot lie it says if he says something he means it if he starts something he will finish it As we read, and I'm sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So uh, that is our second point this morning. So thirdly, I want us to look at verse three. The third thing is that preaching is powerful. Uh, The third thing I want to tell you is how this message has been shared. So yes, it's been planned and promised before the world has begun, But there in verse 3, we read this, and which now, at this appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. So God has been at work from before the beginning of time, and a proper time, it says, uh, uh, these things became clear or or manifested. And it reminds us a little of Galatians chapter 4, doesn't it? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. So it's telling us Jesus came into the world at the perfect time. It was no mistake. It wasn't a coincidence. Everything that had come before and that would come after was a result of God's perfect sovereignty and wisdom. Yes, the wait was long, but in God's perfect wisdom, it was the right time. But notice too what the third verse says. Yes, the truth has been manifested at the right time, but here we see how God communicates his message. Look there in verse 3, it's through the preaching of his word. When you come to church, we do a number of things, don't we? We sing together, and we pray together, and we come around the Lord's table, and we have a, a lovely chat and a cup of tea together, and encourage one another. But the biggest chunk of the service is taken up by the preaching of God's word, isn't it? And that's because preaching is powerful. Uh, God speaks and works through faithful preaching. And we see that throughout the Bible. We are told why Jesus appointed 12 disciples to aid him in his work. It says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. What does Paul say to the church in Philippi? He says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. 
what are Paul's final instructions from, from the, the prison cell that he probably would go and be executed from. Uh, he says to Timothy, preach the word. And possibly the most important verses on the matter in Romans 10, Paul says this, For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless someone is sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word in Christ. So we need preaching. We need preaching that is biblical. We need preaching that is practical, that is edifying, that has been prayed through, uh, that it cannot be self-promoting. It needs to be about Christ. It needs to tell us that we are sinners in need of a saviour. It needs to proclaim that Christ Jesus loves sinners and that he was willing to die in their place. It ought to tell us about the resurrection and the ascension and how Jesus conquering death can give us hope for the future. When a good sermon is preached, Jesus will increase and we will decrease. Why does preaching make a difference in people's lives? This is what Martin Lloyd-Jones had to say. Because it addresses us in such a manner as to bring us under judgment. And it deals with us in such a way that we feel our whole life is involved. And we go out saying, I can never go back and live as I did before. This has done something to me. It has made a difference to me. I am a different person as a result of listening to this. That's amazing, isn't it? That's what biblical preaching will do. It will transform lives. It will convict us of our sin. It will turn weeping into joy. It will open blind eyes and it will raise the dead to life. That is what spirit-filled preaching can do. And that is what Paul did. And that is what Titus would do on Crete. And my hope is that what will happen in Bethel as well. And fourthly and finally, we will see that truth breaks down barriers. Uh, When we reach verse 4, we are eventually told, aren't we, who this is letter is addressed to. Uh, When we write letters or send emails, uh, we of course address the person that we are writing to at the very top. In the first century, the person who wrote the letter introduced themselves at the beginning, which I think probably makes a bit more sense, doesn't it? But it's not there until verse 4 that Paul says to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. And what strikes us is that uh, Paul calls him my true child in the faith. We're all very different, aren't we? If you look around this morning, uh, we're from different backgrounds, different experiences. Uh, We're men, we're women, we're boys, we're girls. Uh, We look different, we speak differently. Uh, Our histories, our upbringings are all different. And this past week has been different to you as it's been different for me. Our temperaments and our personalities are all different. But there is one thing that unites us all as believers, isn't there? That's the Lord Jesus. And and that's the common faith that Paul and Titus had. Uh, Paul was the Jew of Jews. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He had the most religious upbringing you can ever imagine. He has studied the law given uh, by God through Moses. He went to the temple and to the synagogue. Titus was a Gentile, uh, possibly from a pagan background, and yet now they were on the same side. They had the same ambitions. They shared a common goal, to see people come to know the Lord Jesus for themselves. So as I finish this morning, let's remember what unites us as a church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And I'm so thankful that we can be united around the same person. 
So may everything that we do as a church be a reflection of the Lord we serve. And to quote from Paul's words in the letter to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is what we are, brothers and sisters. Uh, We are united by the blood of Christ. So let's build one another up. Let's encourage one another. Let's point each other to Christ, who is God become man, who has been promised from before the world began and has saved us from our sins. And as we explore this letter, my hope is that we will all be encouraged and challenged. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are worthy of all our praise and more. We thank you that you are the God who saves, that you are the God of truth. Uh, We thank you uh, that uh, we can put our trust in you and uh, that uh, you never lie. And uh, the promises that you have made from before the beginning of time, you will stick to. You are faithful and you are good. So Lord, would you uh, help us to take these things in as we explore this book, Lord, we pray that our belief and our behaviour would be entwined, that everything that we do uh, would match up with what we uh, say that we believe. Lord, we know that this is impossible by our own uh, human endeavours. We need the Spirit to work in us. Uh, Lord, would you help us? Uh, We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're going to close this morning by singing uh, a song of praise to our God. So let's stand if we're able and sing glory be to God the Father.